when we're done with foundries, we'll go find the next thing to roll up and the next thing and the next thing. And so, you know, ultimately, if you ask me a hundred years from now, Canecast won't be the name because there'll be another holding company and another holding company and whatever. But ultimately, that will be the thing that made small manufacturing work in the U.S. Yeah, we're not quite the only game in town, but there are there were 4,000 foundries. Okay. And they, uh, a lot of them started back typically in the 40s. So came back from the war, people didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden they build a thousand square foot cinder block building and stick a foundry in it. And so we went from just in our specific type of small aluminum foundries, about 4,000 50 years ago. And there's now, there's 770 before COVID. I would guess there's probably 650 post COVID. And I think Based on the conversations I have, 20 to 50% of those are going to go out of business in the next five years. So what what took us from 4,000 to 700? Consolidation China. or just people going, okay, China? Overseas. And then are any of the ones that are going to go out of business ones that you're interested in like buying the yeah. assets? or? Yeah. So we've got, we've talked to the vast majority. When I say vast majority, I've talked to over 600 of them. Um, and I'm, these are specific niche, small foundries. And they have every single problem imaginable that a searcher, for instance, wouldn't want. They right. have high CapEx costs. They take a lot of working capital. There's key personnel risk everywhere. Customer concentration. Like every single thing that they say not to buy in a search fund is a foundry or any small manufacturing in the US. Okay, so what you said, you're like, we're the only game in town. And I said, when I hear that, I'm like, usually there's a reason why nobody else is done now, it. now you're and here, baby. now you know. <laughs> and honestly, the thing is, is, let's see, seven, almost seven years ago, exactly. Like seven years and two months, maybe one month. Um, I'd never stepped foot in a foundry before I bought my first one. Less than six months later, we owned one. Now we own seven and we'll probably own 30 of these things total. But even then, if you kind of think of a timeline. In the 80s, early 80s, uh, we started to ship a lot more product overseas. There was a lot more supply than there was demand. And then as you got in further into the 80s, especially into the 90s, we were moving a ton of stuff overseas. And at that point in time, no one went into the industry. So if you kind of think of the 90s through today, you know, if you stop having people go into these industries into the 80s, especially in the 90s, there's no people left either. So you have to train everyone um, or you have to buy multiple millions of dollars worth of equipment that you don't get a payback on unless you have enough of them that you can eliminate enough people and or get enough work. So right now it's a great time to be in it. But in order for you to come and compete with us, it would probably cost you... $10 million in capital to build one of our facilities. Yep. And at that same time, you would then need to go find 20 workers. I don't know where you'd find them. You'd need to go find customers that is typically an 18 month sales cycle. I mean, you just, you name it, it is one nightmare after the next, but this is also why when we started looking at this, I talked to a lot of different people in the foundry industry specifically, and they told me I was an idiot for thinking about buying it. They're like, whatever you do, do not buy a foundry. You will hate yourself. This is a terrible, terrible, terrible decision. And in my mind, I thought about it completely the other way. I said, I agree with you. I understand. But I think about it. If I can last three years, five years, seven years, whatever, get over that hump. Now I have moats. And I thought we had a very short window of time because of, you know, think about it, the 30 years. When I bought my first one, it was a lot of the guys, and it is almost exclusively large guys that work in these foundries because you're slinging <laughs> 40 pounds of uh, hot metal for 10 hours a day or hundreds of pounds of sand you're moving around. So we just don't see you know, literally many females, period. But these guys were 58, 60, whatever. And now, seven years later, they're gone. So you've seen... You know, 20% of the foundries go out in the last seven years, but you've probably also seen 80% of the knowledge base leave. Okay, just so we get this out of the way, yeah. what to you, what's a foundry? Maybe there is yeah, only one. There thing, is only what, one. What's a foundry? There is only, well, I mean, so the software guys, they like to find fancy names. It's, uh, you know, they're, <laughs> they have software foundries now and they have chip foundries and other things. But yeah, traditionally, foundries been around for 6,000 plus years. It's the first known casting as a frog from Mesopotamia, I believe. 
something like 5,500 or 5,800 years ago, they think. And what you do mainly, melt metal, pour it into some sort of a form. We are in non-ferrous, mainly aluminum. Non-ferrous just means without iron. So the rest of what you would have, you have steel, iron, you can have all kinds of different materials. But yeah, all you do, quite literally, depending on the type of metal, you heat it up anywhere from 1,300 to 3,000 degrees. And then there's a negative impression of a form. And when you get done pouring it, there it is, you have a product. Of the 700 that stayed in America, could those have all gone overseas too? Or is there a reason why 700 stuck around and didn't go overseas? <laughs> Um, they would tell you hard headed. I yeah. mean, there was some amount of volume left, but it was really hard. And that's also why there's so many, I shouldn't say so many, why the ones are available to buy now. Yeah. Because you see people coming back. There's more work. We, the pendulum swung way too far. Yep. So people think when I talk about this, that I'm just 100% pure US based manufacturing. I actually nuanced that we need manufacturing here. We need manufacturing in Mexico, India, China. There's a reason to have each one of those. And so the ones that stayed, they had really hard times. I mean, a lot of near bankruptcies and or bankruptcies or doing things they weren't comfortable with. So on top of not having the people, none of their kids came into it as well. So when I talk to, I literally know less than 10 foundries in the country that are in our kind of wheelhouse where the kids are even involved today. So they're doctors, lawyers, computer programmers, engineers, whatever, anything but working in a foundry. So when we come in and buy, a lot of times I have conversations with their kids, grandkids, whatever it might be. And they're like, we had no idea that this was even feasible. But and we have one we're trying to buy right now. He's totally convinced one of his kids are going to come back and work in it. And that's why he doesn't want to sell. And I've talked to this kid and they're like, yeah, dad is going to have a really, really bad plan when he finally sells to you because I'm not coming back. In here. There's a, <laughs> he's like, this is like Dante's fourth circle of hell in here. It's hot. It's <laughs> dusty. It's dark. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, it's like where you have to go serve hard time uh, practically. But OK, uh, then you kind of just set the stage there. But what does a typical foundry that you're buying look like? And is there massive foundries or are they yeah. all pretty small? No, 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 no. The vast, vast majority of foundries are large. So 70% of the foundries in this country um, are either private equity owned or captive, meaning, okay. you know, they serve the Boeings or Teslas or whatever the world being captive or private equity owned being their million thousand or their million square feet, you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet, whatever it might be. For us, we're substantially smaller. We have no reason. Um, and that's part of our thesis. This works across all small manufacturing. And I've been saying this for however long I've been on Twitter and these podcasts of geographically dispersed is really important to small customers, especially in geographically, or at least n numerous facilities are really important to large customers. So, you know, when they see when, the larger you get in any one footprint, the larger the quantity you need to go chase where we're completely the opposite. We go find smaller facilities. I won't say specifically because that'll give away part of what we do really well because um, <clears throat> there is a sweet spot in that. But this the, the foundry where you can get the right number of people, the right type of automation, the right size facility, the right government. Um, you obviously deal with Class B industrial. Uh, the NIMBY is alive and well, and you yeah. fire up a foundry and you get a lot, a lot of problems. Yeah. So you can't greenfield anymore, or it's very, very difficult to greenfield. Yeah. So, you know, you have to almost buy existing. And then when you buy existing, it comes with all those other hosts of problems. And that's why private equity wants nothing to do with this space, as small as we are. They want the big thing, you know, the, the hundreds of employees, thousands of employees in one facility, et cetera. Well, how big are yours? Like 10 employees, 20 employees? Is it um, numbers? It, it, yeah. How do you value, how do you think about size? It depends. I mean, so people in automation trade off. So we've got, um, we're going to be piece of equipment we're selling Q1 right now. I won't get into details. It doesn't matter. The specific is that can take up 50 jobs with three people. And that will also do as much work as 30 facilities. So we're the only one that's gonna buy this piece of equipment. Okay. Um, but we're, we'll literally have the only one that's not in a captive facility in North America okay. when it gets installed in Q1. But what that allows us to do now is that layout can be relatively small. 
I mean, you could probably put that in 10,000 square feet and pump out $20 million a year, something like that. Okay. Um, but it would also cost you $5 million to install. Yep. So the only way to do that is get the network benefits first. You have to go get large size and then move back into it. And again, if you're a captive foundry or you know one of the large private equity owned foundries, you would never want to come and deal with the small quantities that we deal with. It's just not worth your time and effort. And that's why we keep them smaller. So it can be as little as, I'm guessing our smallest one right now is probably 10 employees and okay. 12,000 square feet. Okay. Largest one is probably 70 employees right now and 80,000 square feet. So kind of bounces between... All right, we we got into it quick, but yeah, I mean, I, no I, introduction. I, 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 no like, hey, introduction. This so guy, now, now the, we're gonna do the it. The manufacturing guy crashed your uh, real estate podcast with no intro. There's so many people that have already turned off. I think they're like, no, no, no. We, no, the Chris funny, has gone rogue. We've lost his entire audience. It's an entrepreneurship seven, podcast yeah. now. We've we've I love re- it. rebranded. The rebrand, yeah. No, but is that because of the real? Is that because of the rates and everything else in real oh, estate? Oh yeah, that, yeah I'm, like, I'm going to be a manufacturing need, guy here pretty soon. Be a foundry guy. This here, whole yeah. podcast is really a disguise of how I'm going to get into this industry. <laughs> I love it. You worked at GE for a while, so I think it would help the conversation to give listener a background of where you came <sighs> from. And the question just really is like, what was great about GE, and what <laughs> did you learn at GE <laughs> that you're bringing forward, if anything? You know, ultimately, the one thing that corporate, I think, does really well is that they give you a lot of stuff you shouldn't do. Okay. Like, we're never going to make PowerPoints in my company if I can do anything about it. Um, <laughs> we are, uh, we're not going to waste time in meetings. Like, it's a running joke. Josh and I do not have standing meetings. I'm not sure if we've ever put a meeting on each other's calendar. Really? So yeah. you just call each other when you need to call each other? Yep. Typically, it's... Mid morning, so Josh normally gets up in the morning, gets his workout in, goes away. You know, he rents a local office and goes away to the office, works, and then when he's on his way back to his house, when he needs, he'll just call me and we'll talk for whatever twenty minutes, hour, whatever time it is. And it's typically when each when either one of us call each other, say, "Hey, do you have five minutes?" And then an hour later, we'll finally get off the phone. So that's kind of the normal way we handle it. And, and is that just like communication through osmosis that you just trust you'll be communicating about the most things? Or do you all have a cadence of like, we talk about this, you know, on Mondays or we no. talk about no cadence, no plan. We just get whatever's the important part we'll talk about. And typically part of, part of the reason why that is, and don't get me wrong, the company still has a lot of meetings. Josh runs all the day to day. Yep. I really run all of the inorganic strategy, mergers and acquisitions, that type of stuff. So when we talk, it'll be normally Josh will have a question like, hey, I've seen this. I haven't seen this before. Or, hey, can you help with this? Or, hey, do you have thoughts on this? Or whatever it might be. My perspective, a lot of times when I call Josh will be, hey, this opportunity presented itself. Or, hey, I'm thinking about this. What are you seeing? Or, I need more information on this. Go talk with a team. Or, hey, this person pissed me off. Go yell at somebody because I'm going to fire them if I talk to them. So You play bad cop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm I'm the bad cop, bad cop. Uh, got, <laughs> there's a funny, yeah, random aside, but we literally had one of my buddies come in that's in our EBIT Daddy group, which is 12 guys that have holding companies. And I'm pretty confident that he brought me in just to scare the rest of his CEOs. Like, hey, listen, you could work for that guy, all right? So <laughs> be real happy, but anyway. No, so. Okay, I think, well, let's go on uh, across Josh, because I think he's an important part of the story. Did y'all meet on Twitter? We did. Okay, and how did this marriage, this beautiful marriage come to be? Yeah, so... Because I would imagine, all jokes aside, you know operational chops when you see it. Yep. There's probably a lot of people that could have filled this role. Yeah. What so, happened? Um, So, the whole story, overly simplistically, the person who used to run, be the president of our organization, per se... He came in more of an engineering project, that type of work. And the larger we got, the more the operations got, the less he liked the role, the more he wanted to go back to what he appreciated, liked, knew better, et cetera. So then we just had an opening, clearly had realized at this point in the company, we need someone to really take this on. It's something that I can do. I don't do it nearly as well as Josh, and I hate it. So... Really, for us, I had no idea, especially at the time. I didn't plan on hiring Josh when I first reached out. 
I just seen him and he was the only other one talking about manufacturing. And so by him talking through that manufacturing part, he was more or less saying, Hey, here's what I'm doing. Here's what my past has been, et cetera. I'm like, this is perfect. And then when the person left our company, I just reached out and I said, Hey, I, I realized that you don't have an interest in doing anything part-time or consulting or any of that anymore. I just wanted to reach out, chat with you because you've been on my list forever. I haven't had time. You're another person talking about manufacturing. And so anyway, how that really started, there's literally still a time on our calendar. Um, and it's me, Josh, and our two wives where we literally say uh, Josh slash Reg anniversary with a little heart after it. Because uh, <laughs> that's the day that I reached out on DMs. And <laughs> I wrote up, I said, hey, man, I want to talk. And he wrote back and said, all right, well, how about we do this? Like next week when you're going to have some time, you reach out, like just text me. If I'm available, I'll call you back. If I'm not available, then like I'll ping you. And if you're not, and if we go for a week like this and we haven't connected, then we'll finally put something on the calendar. And all I get to go is like, oh my God, a guy that hates me. Like this is perfect. Like we're good. (laughs) And then I was randomly going to pick up parts, called him on the way. He answered, talked for like an hour and a half. So yeah, and that it really just started that we talked about it and, you know, same thing. No, you don't want to do this. And he said, all right, well, I really like what you're doing. I have this, you know, and he kind of walked down through his thing. I really want to run operations. And I've told this part of the story many times, but it was, I realized that I can only run operations if I own the place, even though I don't want to do it. And so he said, let me think about this. And he came back and said, how about for 18 months, I work for you guys. I help you get to the point where we can just turn over a, essentially a COO job to a current director of ops, but I'll fix everything in the meantime. And then that last six months, you, I'll help transition in and you help me figure out how to buy a business. And again, this is where our stories kind of diverge. Um, but my belief is pretty confident. This is what happened. As I said, I have a way better plan. Don't I'm like you, you don't want to buy a business. You definitely don't want to like run the business. You don't want to go find it. You just want to run up. I don't want to run ops. Just come and take this. I have a way Like, just you can have Canecast. If you don't want to talk to me, that's totally fine. I'm not going to have an issue with this. So he flew up and yeah, it's been, it's been great. I, I tell Josh that there tell a lot of people, most of what I hire people, it's more gut feel than anything. There's guys like Gurley that have an unbelievable process yeah. and I hate and suck at processes. So I just had this feeling and after talking with Josh for a couple hours and then I had him up, like, I had every intention and I talked to my wife and I was like, I wonder when he's going to get back to me. She's like, well, have you offered him the job? I was like, no, he already knows he's got the job. He needed to go back to his wife and talk about it. And Dax is like, Hey, by the way, was I clear that you have this? He's like, well, not exactly. I was like, <laughs> oh, that's probably on me. Sorry about that. But anyway. we share that, uh, that superpower. I can't tell you how many times I've been told in my career. I thought they understood exactly <laughs> what I meant and they did not understand it. Yeah. Johnny's probably looking over here going, there's so many times I'm like, Johnny, did we get this? And he's like, you didn't quite communicate that that had to be done. We, we, we talked to, yeah, this is, um, <clears throat> this is definitely a superpower slash failure. If you ask Josh or my wife, like, I thought I was very clear about what I wanted. They're like, you actually have to say those things out loud. It's like, oh, really? All right. Then speaking of what you want. So you, you leave corporate America, you're on fast track to become a C-suite executive, which was your version of hell. And then you said, why not start rolling up the hardest, possibly the hardest industry in the country? Yeah. What is your big, hairy vision for all of this? Like, we're going to work backwards and then we're going to get into like what it's like to buy these companies yeah. and what happens. Yeah. So I grew up in a small town, fundamentally believe we needed U.S. based manufacturing. Again, I think we need all of it, but the pendulum swung too far. I thought we could bring it back. COVID obviously accelerated that substantially and it's and it's happening oh it's nearshoring is a thing it's unbelievable okay. like we we just talked about this morning an opportunity to bring back four million dollars for the sales in one product and there's oh. a thousand of those out there we have a facility a company right now if we could go spin up an eighty thousand square foot foundry they would fill it with a hundred percent because they want to reshore it so it, it is 100 percent happening okay but so let's go back to when i started I just wanted to make US-based manufacturing work. And generally speaking, it 
at the time, it didn't matter that it was foundries. That just happened to be what came up for sale and I walked in. But long term, if you ask what it is, you know, ultimately what CaneCast is right now, my wife and I, we don't have kids. We'll never have kids. We have a French bulldog that while she's expensive is not going to probably use all of it. So everything we have is going into a trust and it's going to be inherited by the employees. It's not going to be an employee owned company. It's actually going to be more like the Cargill model where it will be a sustaining, enduring private company, quite literally built on the idea of maintaining US-based manufacturing. So foundries are first, foundries will not be last. There will be because of our systems and processes and everything that Josh has set up. And I would say my uh, ability to go figure out strategically and kind of doing the M&A side of it, like those two married together. When we're done with foundries, we'll go find the next thing to roll up and the next thing and the next thing. And so, you know, ultimately, if you ask me 100 years from now, Canecast won't be the name because there'll be another holding company and another holding company and whatever. But ultimately, that will be the thing that made small manufacturing work in the U.S. Because of Josh's systems, we can now drop that in. Right now, we know we're typically 20 to 30% more efficient cost-wise than anyone else we take over. And then we also know that as we go through it, everything looks just like the foundry and it's 85, 90% whatever similar. So we can go do this. Now we're just going to have to go find the next one. Again, shiny object syndrome is one main issue I have. So I just have to stay focused long enough to have that happen. But I think we're one year, two years, three years away from that, at which point we'll be going on to the next thing. Okay, so you, how many do you own now? We own seven. Technically, we've we have, we bought seven businesses. We've spun other ones up. We'll have to buy another 15-ish, probably. Yep. But now with the new systems, we can do that multiple times a year. It used to be once every, first ones are like 30 months, 18 months, 12 months apart. Now it's three months if we needed to. Okay, so you said you've there's about 600. You've talked to all of them. What do you tell them when you call them? Obviously, like, hey, we're buying foundries. We'd be interested in buying you. Mm-hmm. Is that the general first conversation? Um, no. Normally, it's this is mine. Mine is much more about the long game. Okay. And there's a lot of them that we go and talk to that will research. So if I go back to this, our really, really simple model is our insight initially was every 500 miles we needed to put a facility. The reason why was the small, you know, some small manufacturer that needed product to get from us would come in. And in order for them to want to come see us, they want to get up in the morning, get their kids to school, drive in, shake hands, have lunch, a couple of beers, drive home and be home in time for dinner. That also allows us to deliver in one day. Well, in order to do that, it's kind of roughly 250 miles or so. So you just kind of figure like there's just a bunch of 500 mile concentric circles on this big map I have. And so we go in there and we've looked and after the people I've talked to and then just go find out from vendors, customers, whoever, who the best one is in that area. Yeah. Talk with them. But normally you don't know who's going to sell and when. So I've just talked to all of them and then I continue on a regular cadence, monthly, quarterly, whatever, uh, just chatting with them. Hey, what's going on with you guys? Here's what we're seeing. Here's how we're handling it. Oh, can I help you with this? Or is there something that, you know, you guys want to make this product for us? Like whatever it might be. And then whenever they're ready. So there's some that'll come out right away and be like, Hey, I know you're buying these. It's obviously very different today than it was five years ago. Why? Because we're just known. We were, we're the people that if, if someone is going to sell their small aluminum foundry in this country, typically we'll say non-ferrous, but then that confuses people. I'll just use aluminum. Um, but thank you. When, when hey, exactly. That's what I'm trying to do. Like, whenever you use non ferrous, I have to go back to this. So, aluminum is what we're calling it today. Um, whenever people sell a small aluminum foundry in the country, we'll get the call somehow. Either they'll talk to someone that they know, or they'll have already known about us because we talked, whatever it might be. But a lot of those, like, we just, we have one right now that I think, based on over the weekend conversation, I've been talking to this guy for three years. I think he literally just broke. And it decided to sell. And it happened during, they had to file their 2022 taxes finally. And they realized how little money they were actually making. Yeah. And I think he's just done. Yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 it's both easy and hard. But because we don't do any outbound, now it's just me talking to people. And eventually they'll be like, hey, would you be interested in buying this? And then it's either a yes or no. It's like, yeah, I'd, I'm willing to buy your customer list. Or yeah, I want to buy your whole foundry facility, whatever. It all depends. Okay, so I I call and I'm like, hey, I'm ready to to sell. 
you probably call Josh and you're like, hey, here's this deal we're going to buy. He starts spinning up a plan of how that'll integrate in and we can get yeah. there in a second. Yeah. But kind of what does your process look like from the day you get that call to the day that you're, you yeah. know, you bought the deal? So I should back up one step okay. behind that. Because we're doing a roll up, and this is why I like roll up so much more than holding companies. What's the difference? So it's a spectrum, I guess. But let's say everybody that talks about whole coast thinks of Bircher, right? Peanut brittle. Peanut brittle and bridge, which by the way, it's all cherry coke. If anyone that actually believes that, <laughs> you've been sold. But anyway, <laughs> um, it's a great marketing scheme. But so what will normally happen is I'll get call it five different numbers that I know or that I need to know and a 15 minute walk to your facility and I'll know roughly what the value is going to be, whether willing to buy it or not, whether we'd buy the whole thing or just a part of it or what we would do with it, et cetera. But yeah, it's, it's that fast now. So if they decide like they might need to refresh me, like, okay, we sent this and I'll be like, all right, well, based on this, based on what I know, just flip back through the notes. You're probably in this general ballpark here. Like then I tell them like, all right, just so everybody's on the same page. I don't want to waste your time. If it, these things can go up or down based on these things. You know, if you have much higher customer concentration or your equipment's way worse than when I've seen it or if I've never seen it. Like, so I give them, it is a formula, but it's, and I always tell them like, this is just the rough way to think about it. We all, we the way we value is different, but we give them that formula. And then once they're like, yep, we get it, no problem, we understand, then normally I'll jump on the plane, talk with them, get a plan in place, and then... Once we get to that, then it's really spinning up the, we just have a due diligence checklist. Um, and I've really, really, really tried to skinny that down just because most of the stuff we need, like if it, if the bank needs it, the title company needs it, that types of stuff, we'll leave it in there. And then there's the few numbers that we need, but the rest of it, we try not to ask for just, especially because if they're not running through a broker and they've bought it from their parents or their grandparent, they've never gone through this process. Legalese is going at a minimum scare them more likely they're just going to get pissed off about it and they don't want to talk about it. And then the other side of it, they don't know all these different processes. So we have to really make it super, super simple. And a lot of times they don't want anybody to know about it. So they don't want their admin. They don't want anyone else in the company to know. So we try and make it as simple as possible to quite literally down to if we need financial data or something like that. Typically, it's QuickBooks, what these guys will use. We literally have them Okay, do you have QuickBooks Online or QuickBooks Desktop? Okay, we have this. Okay, follow exactly this. Click on this button here. Oh, yeah. Do this, do that, do the, and it'll literally spit out the exact data we need. That's what we've had to get to. So we make it as ungodly simple as possible. And that's pretty much when I, and so we normally will get, like, our executive team knows everybody that we're looking at right now, or most of them. So then we turn it over to them within somewhere around two to four weeks around there and be like, all right, it's now you're going to get this. This is going to be coming at you. Here's how you need to integrate whatever. Right? Before then, they don't really need to be involved. They just need to run the day-to-day. Um, and Josh is running less and less of the day-to-day now. He's building the systems out. He's getting close to the end of it. That's why I think we're within one to three years of being able to move on. But now the team that has to do it, they'll figure out, okay, here's what we're going to have to do to move them into our ERP. Here's what we're going to have to do to get bank accounts spun up or credit cards or whatever else it might be. And again, it's just now it's just a checklist. So really simple. And what's the total length to transact 90 days? It all depends. I mean, it, it it's much more driven by outside. So if we need to do environmental studies or title work or something like that, that will always be the gating factor for us. And and to, and to confirm the difference between a hold co and a roll up, hold co you could have lots of different businesses in different industries, a roll up is yep. more homogenous. Damn, I didn't even get to that answer. I got to It's okay. I'm going to bring you back. I like it. Appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, so hold co is just multiple disparate businesses that are not connected in any way shape or form. A roll up for us um or for anybody very very similar exactly the same business inside of an industry. So in our case I'll just say all aluminum foundries, yeah. small aluminum foundries. Specific. What's the other non-ferrous Deke, word? Yeah, <laughs> non-ferrous. It and just then, means no iron. I mean, <laughs> ferrous. Like everybody knows the periodic table. I think they do. No iron. Dude, I'm in real estate. Yeah. We are the <laughs> lowest common denominator of people, and that's why we get into it. Uh, oh, I love it. <laughs> what you said? I buy either part of a business or all of a business. Yeah. 
how do you determine if you're going to just buy part of it? What would be a situation where you're just going to buy a piece of it? Yeah, um, two main things. One, if they have any type of environmental problems, including lead, we won't touch any of that, generally speaking. And the other side of it will be if we don't need their equipment. So we'll just say, okay, you guys can have everything. We'll just you already pick have up it? Your, exactly. We can just pick up their customer list and we can build it much more efficiently in our facilities than they can there. There's And we don't need that geographic location. If the real estate doesn't make sense or whatever doesn't work out when we buy it, we'll just say, hey, we'll buy it, we'll move it, even if we don't own something. So our terminology, um, beachhead would be our facility in one, like we have in Minneapolis, Kansas City, Cincinnati, South Carolina, New Hampshire. Like, okay, that's our beachhead. And then we'll go and find tuck-ins around that and roll those into that facility. So the workers can still work for us. Uh, anything we need, we just don't need their equipment. We don't need their building. Or again, if it's environmental, we don't touch anything that's leaded. So they still make leaded bronze in this country, very, very tightly controlled. But you're also begging yourself to have environmental problems and we don't touch it. So if anything pops, if anything pops into phase one, a lot of times the sellers don't even want to go down the phase two path. But especially we get to that, I don't, I don't want to be a real estate guy. I don't want to be doing remediation. I want to be a founder and building a product. Okay. Why would, okay. When I hear like, we're going to buy your customer list, but we're, t you're going to keep all the rest of it. What do they have left? Or is you just saying that those businesses really only value is their customer list? Yeah, it, it, it is. Even now, because there's so many foundries that have either gone out of business or will be going out of business, the equipment is scrap value, typically. Yeah. Some of it will be a little bit more than scrap, but not much. And so we'll normally give, if it gets to that point, we'll give people the option, one of three things. We can say, all right, we can, let's say we do want to buy their assets, which is rare, but anyway, we'll see. We'll give you X percent of trailing 12 months whatever your sales is trailing, especially if they're negative margin, which is shocking to people. We have a lot of negative margin foundries in this country that we buy. Um, and so we'll say, cause you can't give them a multiple on negative margins, obviously. I mean, then, I'd like then, to, then they give you money. I, I, they like give to. you they give me money. the business and the, uh, <laughs> for some reason they're not interested in that. But so typically we'll say you can give all your money up front at close, we'll just hand you a check. You hand us everything. We're good. Second option is you take, a smaller percentage of trailing 12 months and then a uh, percentage for year two and a percentage of year three in sales, meaning, and a lot of times I would take that if I were them, but because then we're going to take that, we're going to raise their price. We're going to go get more sales, whatever it might be inside of there. Like they would make a lot more money, but their money's being spread over three years versus immediately. Um, and then the third option would be we'll value their assets. We'll get an appraisal done and we'll pay them whatever asset appraisal value is. All right, here comes a dumb question. Negative margin. Do they know their negative margin? So the before COVID and stimulus, the answer was yes. Even the small people that ran it like a checkbook, they at least, it was small enough that they could run it with cash and how that checkbook worked. Once PPP and EIDL and ERC and all the rest of that hit, it's the wild west. And this is why I said starting last fall, when they, you know, when September, October came around and they realized that they didn't raise their price enough from 2020 and their 2021, both, but they were getting stimulus. So their checking account was going up. And then their accountants finally sorted through their mess and said, by the way, you lost money last year. And then they typically went through 2022. And again, Two months ago, the last month and a half, they've been told from their accountant, you lost money again this year. So, yeah, I think they used to do that or they used to know that. But then when the stimulus hit, they got behind. They couldn't believe they'd have to raise prices as much as they had to. I mean, we had commodities up 50 percent or 100 percent in some spaces. Labor was up 20, 30 percent. Insurance in the foundry industry is an absolute nightmare. Um, so everything was massively up and they were getting they asked for like 3 percent or 5 percent. And we're like, we raise price 50% or, you know, depending on the company. But yeah, a lot of times we buy these, they're way, way under market because they have customer concentration. If that one customer leaves, their business is completely bankrupt and out of, I mean, it'll quickly go under rather than slowly go under. So they are in a bad spot and it's a totally different animal for us. But yeah, it's, it's not sophisticated. I mean, it, we've still seen places. We bought one 
five-ish years ago that was still being run with paper and pencil. Like, never, like actual double bookkeeping accounting. He was filling it in two spots in his paper and pencil, like T, like ledger. I love that guy. It, it was amazing. I was like, <laughs> and then my, all right, so this is, a, this is a little bit of a war story, but my favorite part about that is that he said, I'll go get these books digitized, but I want the table. So like his actual table that his grandpa worked on, that he worked on, that his dad, whatever, did their accounting in. They, that's the thing he wanted. That was his one personal item he took out of the entire place. I freaking love people like that, man. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, that. it was like an old drafting table. Like I hadn't <laughs> seen one in 30 years. You know, they existed. That's my favorite part of America. That is like, that is, that's like real america right there the incredible part he was making good money too i love that but guy. He, he had it like he would it was every night he would send someone around they would check every single part like they literally knew where every single part was in their facility every single time now granted they were tiny yeah but still three generations uh that was his life yeah Right. Okay, so you said that you you usually don't buy the assets, and that's because you already have them, or because yep. they're usually like def- they're they're not even usable really. Anymore. Yeah, we'll, we'll normally just take a piece of them. Um, <clears throat> most of them, yeah. By the time we buy these things, normally they are in so they just they haven't been maintained. They're so old; it's just not used. To it. And we've got so much extra equipment because we bought so many, and then we consolidate, and then we buy new equipment and. We'll fix up the existing equipment we have, and then we'll essentially mothball it. So even when we buy it, like if we were to get it, we would upgrade with our old equipment, which is nicer than their existing equipment. Or we'll just put it onto brand new automated equipment, and it'll do thirty times more per hour than what their old equipment would be. So how do you do due diligence on equipment? Do you do you just walk around with a little hammer and just? Ding, ding on everything and if you I hear a certain even, sound no i just look at it you, literally yeah and then you can look at it and say we already know there's something out in the market that can do 30 times production of that yeah. or we already have that in yeah. inventory and josh has probably created some inventory mastermind system yep. That- yep. yeah no, that's what i said that's the great part about roll-ups is that by just walking so the first time i did this it took me like probably 45 or 60 days just to decide that i was going to understand enough to make an offer and now i can do it in seven minutes so walk through and I'll just see the equipment. I was like, oh, I know that specific type of equipment had this problem. And I had, hey, have you guys rebuilt this? No. All right. Well, that's completely trash. I was like, yeah, you guys are probably having a really hard time making molds on that. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, I bet the thing like it shifts. They're like, yeah. I'm like, well, because that should have been replaced 20 years ago. So if I didn't know you and you walked into my business and in seven minutes knew yes or no, I'd either be like, this guy no- doesn't know shit. I'm about to take <laughs> into the cleaners or I would be mortified that oh my god this is a stone yeah. cold killer yeah normally it's much more it, it it's typically more the second the more we talk how about that yeah no uh, I, trust me <laughs> initially they're like this young punk like i am going to fleece him and then by the end they're like damn it we better sell this thing now because either that or he's just gonna own everybody around us so yep. yeah, it's uh, all right, we're about to get to what happens after closing, but I want to go back real quick. You said, you know, uh, once we get past closing, I know nothing because that's Josh, right? Just so we're clear. All right, okay. Right. You you do are give we, like, you know, like phone a friend. Well, for the somebody rest of this? has <laughs> to give like a speech or something. You have to give some type of speech. All right, I can't wait. We'll get to it. All right, we'll get let's to get through it. the rest. Of this. But you said uh, it's not an ESOP. We're putting it all in a trust, and we're going to basically let it be employee controlled or whatever. Yeah. Well, there'll be a professional. I think. What and then you said the Cargill model. <laughs> yeah. Explain a little oh, bit sorry. more about that. I've never yeah, heard yeah. anybody say this. Before. Okay, so uh, overly simplistically, one of the largest privately held companies in the world, but they more. So I, I'll back up a little bit. What scared the what? I don't know if I can swear in your podcast or not. Uh, yeah, you Founderman, can. Founderman, like it just comes out. Like it's just come weird. on, just beaten. Be your authentic uh, self. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um. Anyway. So I went to Vanderbilt and got really interested in the family. Then we moved up to Connecticut, went to see the breakers and a bunch of the other houses and saw all the different things they built, like the Biltmore, and just watched a family tear apart one of the greatest fortunes of all time really, really fast. Uh, and the idea of, obviously, I'm not having kids, but it doesn't matter to me conceptually when I did this. I wanted to start this in order to make U.S.-based manufacturing work. I always say I didn't want it to be that my nieces or my godsons or 
some random employees won the genetic lottery and all of a sudden they've got $200 million in their bank account. That's just asking for major issues. So we created this with the idea that we would form it down a certain path. And my biggest worry about it was how we were going to professionalize it without turning it into a corporation that does things like make PowerPoints and doesn't add any other value in the world. Ultimately, some of that's going to be inevitable, but um, <laughs> the idea would be that the, there will be a professional board. They'll have professional you know, presidents, CEO, C-suite, all the different managers, et cetera. And the reason why it was so important to me to do that not only just the manufacturing side, but every time I see ESOPs, so initially, because I've, I've seen a lot of foundries that have ESOPs, a lot of small manufacturing that have ESOPs. Um, and the biggest issue with employee-owned is that everybody's a boss and nobody's a boss. So it works in big white-collar places where you clearly have a structure, there's a, you know, there's a pecking order, everybody sort of gets it. But in a blue-collar shop where you have a, a general manager and then a bunch of people, maybe there's some supervisors, but now all of a sudden you have 10 people and they each own 10% or 8% or whatever, it, it just tears apart at the seams. So we wanted to find a different way of something saying, okay, here's effectively what you have to go do over the next 50 years. This is your charter that you have to go down, which made for some interesting times, let's say with our trust attorneys. But the idea would be that they have to go down that path and do this, and there will be a professional organization built around going to do that. Um, and we'll see. Uh, it's revocable now. Uh, it'll be irrevocable as soon as my wife and I pass. That's sort of what it'll amount to. So in like 100 years. I hope so. Although the rate this cough is going, once I pick up those <laughs> non-filtered uh, cigarettes, I bet you it's not going to last that long. <laughs> Uh, all right, real quick on, on nearshoring, uh, onshoring, whatever we're going to call it. You said there's like a thousand products that you could just start bringing back into the country. Yeah. Not just foundry products. Yeah, literally there's millions of them. Millions. To be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. Okay. This is obviously something that you're passionate about, yeah. but it's also profitable and you've seen that there's a way to make this a good business. Yep. I'm assuming it's, you're, you're not a, a nonprofit and not a, a nonprofit. I'm not a charity. Correct. Yeah. Uh, what is it going to take for more people? Because when I hear you say like there's millions of these, the entrepreneur in me goes, I'm just going to go start looking down the list and just start bringing product back. Yep. If you had a 10 year vision or just kind of what are the dominoes that will happen to where this starts happening more rapidly, yep. what would need to happen? And if China came out tomorrow and <laughs> created some law or something. Is there anything that could kill onshoring from yeah. accelerating or is the cat out of the bag? I think the simple way to look at it is that, again, the pendulum swung too far. We're not going to move 100% back. We're not going back to the 1930s or whatever. Like that's never, and there's no reason for that. But there's two main things that have happened. One, <clears throat> we swung too far to begin with. And two, technology is way better today than it was 30 years ago. Yeah. So that, it's inevitable that some of this is coming back. The biggest problem and the biggest hindrance for us in the U.S. is people and the actual structural base around what you need. So here's a simple example. Um, in this room, there's lights, there's cameras, there's this microphone for anybody that's not on there. You can go source any of this and it will have all the supporting infrastructure around what you need to do really, really simplistically in China. Yep. In the U.S., it doesn't exist. Okay. It's gone. Um, obviously, it did exist. We haven't built up that level in the U.S. to go after that. So it has to start simple and it has to get more complex. I shouldn't say that. You have two. It, it's it's pretty much like a barbell. You have the really simple stuff that we can do today. And then you have a long skinny. There's not nearly as much. And then there's the really high end complex stuff that we can do as well. It's all that supporting infrastructure in the middle that we just do not really have. Partly, we didn't want it. Partly, we still might not want it. There's a few other pieces inside of there. So that's really what's ultimately driving this. Now, there's also a lot of different pieces. You know, China's not nearly as low cost as what it was 30 years ago. Um, you know, low cost now is Africa. Good luck figuring out how to get a foundry in Africa and getting parts over here. It's going to be real, real hard. Obviously, China's doing it as we speak. Yeah. But, you know, things like Vietnam and other, you're chasing low cost. Right. But eventually that runs out. 
And at that point in time, we can still replicate the difficulties in what it would take to solve the supply chains. We can solve with technology, whether that be automated physical equipment and or backend systems. This is where by having a balance sheet and the network effects that we have, we can put in both the automation from a physical equipment standpoint. And then again, back to all the systems that Josh is building. You know, we are just way more efficient. Like I've literally had numerous private equity companies that have seen what we've done say, we want to come and buy your systems and we want to drop it into every one of our operating companies we have. Um, so that's obviously really important. So the question, there's two parts now left to this. One, how do we get more people to do it? It has to continue to grow. It has to be one at a time, but it has to go back where you start with one and it's just going to be a three, five year, seven year slog like what we've gone through. You have to be able to start to train people. You have to be able to start to build enough that you know it's a balance sheet ability that you have enough product to push through the automated equipment that you have enough money to hire people like Josh to do this. That second part or the third part there, we're trying to shortcut and I can get into this in a minute, but we're trying to take Josh's systems and we're going to essentially give them away to other manufacturers in order for them to use the systems that we have, that we've built that no one else can afford. That's going to be our contribution. Cause again, this is where my passion lies to go help other people be able to do this. Um, and now, so what can derail this? There's two major macro environments. Obviously, the economy always can. Long-term, cyclical, it go up and down. The other big part is that you know, during the Beijing Olympics, a few other things, they were shut down two, three days out of the week because they needed to conserve power. Well, now COVID's gone. So that big glut that we had with supply chain problems, getting it, you know, people that are in manufacturing or people that saw the lack of toys on the shelves, you know, they heard about the hundreds of ships that were off of Long Beach. Those are all gone. There's none. So you have a very hungry China. Now they've got two or three more days of production coming and you have supply chains physically shipping that want to be able to help. So that is a massive, massive problem coming. And this is what I told people, like COVID was great, but a lot of people didn't invest in their small manufacturing companies during COVID like we did. And now they're probably too late. Yeah. When that that, that tidal wave that is coming is going to be, and that's what that's why I think we're going to see 20 to 50% of these small manufacturing, small foundries at least, I don't know about all manufacturing, just disappear because they're just going to be flooded. And, you know, they're in their 60s or 70s, their workers are older, they don't have the balance sheet to maintain it. They probably lived on stimulus, so their prices are wrong. That It's just a perfect storm of things that are going to run over them. And this is why we're being so aggressive and getting out in front of it to make sure this works. Uh, so again, currently foundries for us, there'll be a bunch of other ones that we go get. But in the meantime, we're just going to go help people. So we can get into that at some point in time as well. But Josh, we will, but explain that real quick. Yeah. So you're saying is what you just said that China's kind of built back up and they're fully producing again, which creates a, another advantage to them because yeah. they can produce at cheaper costs than Americans still. Yeah, they definitely they're definitely cheaper. They're just not nearly as cheap. You know, it used to be eight times different or 10 times different. Now it might be two or three times um, or 30 percent. But yeah, the big deal. And this is the other kind of macro environment. We in the U.S. can't figure out how to get out of our own way from an energy perspective. They're building untold amounts of nuclear facilities, coal solar, plants. wind, coal. They don't care. But it, well, the biggest issue is coal, generally speaking, is probably not that much more efficient than we are. Now, let's say really, really um, <clears throat> energy intensive industry like we have in foundries. Roughly speaking, we might, I'll just use a number up, um, 10 cents a kilowatt hour, 8 cents, 12 cents, depending on where we are in the country. Nuke is going to be one and a half cents. Or once they install the infrastructure for let's say solar or wind, and then you have batteries, it's effectively free. Yeah. So if in foundries where we have, call it 10% or some other energy intensive industries might have 20% of their total cost structure is energy. And now China's got an 80% efficiency gain on it. I'll never, it's impossible. I've, they've yeah. now just literally wiped out 10, 15, 20%. And now what you, you know, all of a sudden it went from, let's say 30% is now back up to close to 100% you know, difference or used to be eight X. Now it's on a three X. Now all of a sudden it's five X again. Yep. And what used to be $8,000 for a container, $13,000 for a container is back to two. And instead of taking 13 hours now, all of a sudden or 13 weeks, it's now six. So yeah. it's a great long-term trend. 
there's just some real, real bad short term things that we're going to have to get over in order to get us there. Yeah. And we don't have a government that seems to want to help us do this right now. <laughs> I think uh, the perfect uh, bow on that as it relates to China is uh, California so graciously cleaning up uh, yeah. San Francisco oh, for was the a- dictator of <laughs> communism. <laughs> Yeah, that's it took years, couldn't get it done, else. and then all of a sudden it took a couple of days. Yeah, I was down. We were actually we went to a concert. We were out in Napa, and the meatpacking district was that was a war zone. We were there in June, yeah, or was it July. I, I, that was like a third world country, zombie land. Yeah, it was crazy. But anyway, uh, so the point being, for to getting back to your uh, to kind of solve that, there's just going to need to be a lot of macro stuff. And again, we have a ton of NIMBY problems here, as people know. Yeah. And, you know, I tell this story frequently that there's uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet in a redone, used to be a warehouse and manufacturing facility. I went to buy some. I was like, hey, I need 50 to 100,000 square feet in this facility. I want to consolidate all these places. I went and talked to them and they asked me what a foundry was. And I told them, hey, we heat it up, we melt it, we pour it in. And they're like, yeah, sorry. When we said we wanted industrial manufacturing, we wanted coffee shops and or sorry coffee roasters and breweries and candle makers not like we want to have this like walkable i'm like (laughs) i'm not your guy yeah yeah. (laughs) good luck all right i can't get off this part training people yeah this is like an issue no matter kind of what industry you're in in the blue collar world yep but i would imagine being in a hot however you describe the room dante's four circle dante's four circle of hell Uh, there's not kids, uh, dreaming in high school yeah. of doing this when they're older. Yeah. So how are y'all, uh, yeah. bridging this gap? Yeah. A lot of, so we have two, let's say three. There are certainly some people that love it. They love working with their hands. They come in in the morning. There's a stack of ingots on one side and to the other side, by the end of the day, they've made a part that goes out the door. And that's a deer stand that they use or a golf ball washer that they use or whatever they can point to it. And they can be proud of the fact that they're an artist and a craftsman that made something. A There's, golf ball washer, like where you pump it. Literally, we made them. Yeah, we literally made them. Oh, baby. Yeah, and I have parried. Great customer of ours. <laughs> um, and so anyway, God, so many stories whenever I tell things. Um, <laughs> anyway, so then there's other two other types. There's a lot of immigrant population. So folks that. You know, this is something we can train everything. You don't need a high school degree. We can train everything as we go across in our facilities. We have an entire training matrix. We've literally had to create a training academy, which is another one of those moats. If you go back to, you know, key personnel risk, we have it in spades. We're If anyone is near our size, they don't have nearly, I shouldn't say that. There is nobody our size because we look like currently five separate small foundries rather than one big one, but we have all the networking and all the resources available that that one big one would have. We just happen to be scattered. But, you know, we have a chief technology officer. We always have Josh as a president CEO. We have a director of ops. You know, we've got numerous engineers kicking around. We have equipment that no one else can buy. We have you. <laughs> I'm not important. <laughs> I will live on my wife's and I still never take it any more than IRS mandated minimum. We live off my wife's salary. <laughs> so anyway, that's no joke. Um, but anyway, the... The idea of training people, though, is now we have it. So we bring someone in. We know exactly what they're going to do. We're going to start with this. You're going to watch this Loom video. You're going to read this things. You're going to go talk with this person after X amount of time. Then you're going to do this role. But we have that. And we do that at our very base blue collar worker all the way up to like the levels above it. Um, but those people that come in, so it doesn't matter. If you love it, great. You're going to be passionate. You're going to go through it. If you're an immigrant, we're going to take you through that. If you're someone that made really bad decisions when you were young and you just got out of prison, you can walk right in our door. And as long as it wasn't too violent, I'll caveat that in a second, or something that like you stole from someone, we're welcome to give people second, third, whatever chances. And partly people talk about this. They're like, well, what if they like whatever, some physical crime? I was like, well, here's the thing is after 10 hours of 1400 degrees and uh, slinging 100 pounds, I've never seen anybody get in a fight the day in an end of a foundry. <laughs> it doesn't happen because they're all completely exhausted. Yeah. Um, but yeah, honestly, it's so that's what we do. We we know, you know, we're not getting we're not getting well educated people coming into that. But on the other side of it, we still need a lot of those blue collar folks today. We still will going forward, but we're getting more and more white collar. 
So we have a lot more controls engineers. We have a lot more you know, programmers. We have people running the machine shops. We've got, you know, eventually we'll get into 3D metal printing, whatever, wherever it goes. So we're still on the very cutting edge. And again, back to the differences. If you have one of these, you can't afford that. Um, right. So we're turned on to the small group. We have way better efficiencies and we have this whole plan on how we train them. And it doesn't matter where it is. So all that stuff going back to the corporate thing, how I learned as a manager or whatever of people, then now we're distilling that down. So our first line, the first time they get promoted to be a supervisor, there's certain training they go through. Manager, another set of training they go through. And we bring them all together. I'm a big believer in building culture. So that means like you're going to come in. We just did this six, eight weeks ago, whatever it was, brought them in, trained them for four. We gave them a tour of the facility so they could see what a really like well-functioning foundry looks like. The one in Minneapolis, which is probably three times or two, probably two times more efficient than anyone that we have in our existing facility, probably three or four times more efficient than any other small foundry in the country. So we're able to show them, hey, here's what we need to get everybody to. Here's four, five, six hours of training. And then here's 10 hours of debauchery with us where we're just going to build culture and have a good time. So kind of all those pieces get into how we eventually train people. One, we're going to build culture one beer pong exactly. cup at a time. In our, in our, in our case, it was, uh, <laughs> it was golf. Uh, it was a golf simulator. Apparently, foundry guys don't play a lot of golf, yeah. except for me. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. Um, By the way, I told you this was going to go long. No, this is great. I'll talk to you I'm, about I'm, Look, this is for an audience of one. I'm I'm super, I, I'm not done yet. Because you're getting out of your- you'll, out, know, you'll know when I'm done. I go get, from like here to- zzz, You're getting out of real estate. It'll be pretty quick. All the questions you want to know. Well, I just want to be your landlord. By the end of this, I want to sign some leases. Okay. One thing you said also that I just thought was interesting, and I was actually talking about it this morning at breakfast, because I have a guy that I know really well that's actually been on the podcast, and he manufactures- things for the aerospace industry. Yep. And he talks about a lot of these businesses, their moat being the equipment's embedded yep. cost. You could sure. never recreate the business yep. because of the cost of equipment and yep. staffing and everything else. Yep. Can you just go on a little bit further? Cause yeah. I can, in one way you're telling me like, I don't even buy the equipment some of the time, yep. but how do you think about that as being part of your yep. moat, the equipment? Yeah. So <clears throat> you gotta think about equipment in two different ways. A lot of that is used equipment that we've already fixed up. So specifically to us, I'll say, and then I can speak about it more generally with manufacturing in the US. Typically for us, we've had to maintain that equipment. That was part of how we initially got over the hump. And yeah. then by maintaining that equipment or fixing it up and getting it to the peak of its efficiency and what we did with all of our systems and people to get more product out the door, we made enough money to be able to jump over that chasm and now buy that $5 million piece of equipment <clears throat> that you could never buy. So yeah, that creates a moat, but you need to have enough. This is why I said you need that time in order to get there. Because yeah, if you want to go stand up our facility right now, the one that we're putting this into, we'll have a total of $6 million into a facility that's taken 50 years to get $20 million a year in sales. So your timeline would have to be so long yeah, And we, without, th just by building this, we probably got the last 30 or by buying this last one, we got the last 30 or 40%. So we had, let's say 50 or 60% of an ability to buy the equipment and pay for it after six years. Now we finally bought the seventh one that gets us finally over the hump where it can pay itself back. Yeah, But we've 10 X'd our business in order to do that. Yeah. So it's not something you can just, because again, it's not sequential. It's not like, oh, I'm going to buy this piece of equipment. And suddenly all these customers are going to show up. It's an 18 month, typically 12 to 18 month lead time from the time you start talking to a customer until they're going to move product to you. Yeah. So the timeline is there, the equipment. And so now with that equipment that they have, just because we have extras of it, because we've bought this really new stuff, we've got old stuff that is still, you know, let's say to buy new would be hundred thousand dollars let's say per piece of equipment real simple cheap stuff and if you want to go rebuild it it'd be thirty thousand but we're just saying for us it's not worth the 30 grand it's worth three thousand dollars currently because it's scrap yeah uh, that's why so now more generalized with that 
the bigger you get, especially if you don't have multiple facilities, the larger and larger you're able to buy equipment. And yeah, for like some of the aerospace guys, I mean, this happens with machine shops. That's why I hate machine shops. You can go buy a million and a half dollar piece of equipment and a great programming person, and you can be a competitor of almost everybody in a machine shop. In a foundry, you need to spend 10 or $15 million to do that same thing. Aerospace guys, right, they'll have 250 ton presses that'll cost you millions and millions of dollars. They'll need a building to put it in. Again, everything still has this, you have to have customers and they're not, you know, aerospace. My, anyone doesn't really matter. It's going to take some lead time. It's not like buying something off of Amazon where you're like, oh, I want that. And I think about it today. Yeah. There's a huge lead time in doing this. And again, it comes back to the other mode aspect of this is if you don't already have something that exists, good luck getting it permitted in our country. So, you know, there's an element of partly equipment, partly just how you're going to stand up and get your permits to even be able to have some large, you know, if you're an aerospace manufacturer, let's say you're stamping parts, whatever it might be, that's a really, really loud situation. Nobody is going to let you come into their park and, you know, whether it's even an industrial park, like, hey, we had a nice and quiet office environment. All of a sudden, this dude has got a 110 decibel you know, press running from four in the morning till seven at night. It just, your noise pollution people are going to come out. And, I mean, it just so. So it, it's noisy. Yeah. I mean, it, even in foundries, we don't have anything specifically that would be that noisy of like stamping parts or some of that, but you're still knocking parts together. They're moving things. It, you know, it sounds like uh, if you've ever been in a, a big industrial facility, there's a reason why they say you have to wear ear protection inside. You've got a consistent, 80, 90, 100 dB environment, just ambient. It just happens everywhere. And then there's other things that you get all of a sudden to 120 or 130. That's like jet engine level um, <clears throat> sound barriers. So it. this is why I say like it, equipment is one part, but the entire ecosystem and infrastructure is just ungodly hard when it comes to small manufacturing. Do you worry about 3D printing? Not at all. Um, we already incorporate 3d printing and some of the stuff we do, most of the stuff, 3d metal printing, it'd be the same reason. Why would a customer go out and spend today? It'd be 4 million to $10 million to buy it. Why would they ever do that? They wouldn't use it all themselves. People don't want to use those assets. It's a terrible return on investment, comparably speaking to what you can do to, let's say, invent a new product. So it's going to continue to come to us. We just pay attention to it. And so when it's time for us to, instead of having a muller and an overhead sand system and an automated uh, molding equipment, whatever, we'll just buy a 3D metal printer and stick it in a clean room and be off and running. So, no, zero, zero. I was deathly afraid of it six and a half years ago. Now it doesn't mean one thing to me. But y'all could 3D print for other people or no? Yeah, 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 we definitely could. It's just the value just isn't there. Yeah. I mean, it'd be... Will it ever be there? Uh, simple parts for aluminum, I'd say never, but it won't be in your and I's lifetime. Yeah. Um, real complex geometries, things that care about tiny, tiny amounts of difference and the price is almost doesn't matter. Like, let's say saving money on a 747 that flies every single day. Um, yeah, you really care about an ounce. Vast, vast majority of people could care less. So they're just, they don't, it won't matter. Um, I would say you're, for us, that simple type of parts we do, 20 years at least. Okay. We won't, we won't have to get into all the post-close stuff. I mean, I, it's really easy. I can tell you. So okay. we closed on our business April 14th. Josh had seen them essentially two weeks beforehand. We signed the documents, I think, on the 13th, Thursday or whatever it was. And uh, Monday morning, Josh went and told everybody. So this is the first time Josh took it right from the very beginning, but again, if I go back to it, Josh and I talk about it. That we're two sides of the two different sides of the same coin. I do all the inorganic stuff. He goes organic. The first time he was on, What's when we mean? bought our facility. So sorry, um, Josh runs all. Josh is focused on organic growth, day to day operations, making sure whatever we own today continues to run. I focus on strategically. Are there other things we want to go look at? Big picture for the company. What companies do we want to go buy? Who do we want to buy them? How do I put that network together? Because it's not like I can just say, I want to go, I'm in Fort Worth. I want to go buy a foundry in Fort Worth today. 
I can't. That's not my decision. It's the seller's decision. So I've got to have 300 different options out there, 35 of which right now I want to buy. And whenever that pops up, I have to figure out like, okay, this guy decided he wanted to sell. Like when the guy in South Carolina, he walked away. We walked away from the deal last year. He called us in February and I was like, great. Because now I have to realign every plan that Josh and I had made over the prior two days. Um, That was our new, and we're like, all right, but that's just, so that's my job. So yeah, literally April 17th, 9 a.m. Um, and we have it down to like specifically what we do when. So we know we let everybody start on Monday morning or maybe Tuesday morning. Um, they work their shift. They get their product going. So they have to go back to something. At their first break of the day, we come in there and we tell them like, hey, by the way, we bought the business last week. Um, and what we do is we have the seller go up and say, hey, here's what happened. We want it out. Here's what these guys, here's why we sold to them. And then he just turned it over to Josh. So, and then beyond that, I mean, we've got specifics, you know, as soon as they get out of that meeting, it's going to go through wildfire throughout the, the industry. So Josh and the seller got on the phone and started calling all the key customers and all the key vendors said, Hey, what do you know? Is the situation? We know a lot of people, so that's not a big deal. And then typically Thursday of that first week. So let me back up. We go Monday at noon, we bring in food. We let them cause we right after the 9 a.m. meeting, they're completely shell shocked and they go freak out for three hours and they come back and have their lunch. We bring them pizza or whatever. We let them ask whatever questions they want. Like, all right. And we're like, nope, we already told you this isn't going to change. This isn't going to, this is going to get better. We're going to invest. We're not shutting you down all these things. And then typically Thursday, we kick the seller out and shut down early, bring in beer, pizza, whatever again, and just say, Hey, it's been four days. Nothing's changed. You guys will like it. What's good, bad. Now that the seller's gone. You trust us enough by then Josh had walked around and talked to every employee and then they air their grievances. And it's, uh, it's pretty much exactly like you'd expect the airing of grievances to go most of the time with these sellers, but employees normally aren't big fans ultimately. Yep. And that's it. And what do you do with the grievances? Do you actually like, it's one thing to hear them. There's probably some that you hear that you're like, yeah, I think you're always going to be pissed off about this. If you're pissed off about that. But then obviously there's some things that I guess you just uh, rank, prioritize how yep. you're going to fix those things. Yeah, so we are very upfront about it. We just say, listen, we're not promising anything. You can tell us whatever you want. There's some stuff that we know we're going to fix. We, you know, hey, we don't have this benefit. Okay, we have that. Like, we offer 401ks. You're going to have 401k. Simple answer. There'll be other stuff that they don't like about <clears throat> we did this, we did that. Okay, we'll take it under advisement. But we say specifically... We're not changing anything for the worse. Cross what you guys do. You're going to have exactly what you have, if not better. But we also don't promise any changes until we know more. We just say, hey, we're first week, first month, first three months, whatever. First 10 years. Yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. But normally, my general take is unless it's a turnaround or some other distressed reason, there's no reason to start changing stuff really fast. Yep. That we can we will in the case of output. So a lot of times we'll input, like we have a different way we pay people, incentivize them to get more work out the door. That stuff happens very quickly. The other stuff we don't mess with. But okay. that's also because we bought so many of them. We can say, you guys are doing X. We're doing Y in all these other facilities. We need you to get here. But once you get here, and the reason we do that is then we can invest. We can put more equipment in here and we can move more work in here. We can do whatever that needs to be. So there's a reason behind it. And most of the time, the employees don't know that the business is being sold while it's happening. I've, it's only happened to me one time. And I was very annoyed that it happened. I don't mind if the key people find out a little bit ahead of time, but why does it annoy you? Because they'll catastrophize. They, by the time we show up, they'll be totally freaked out. Oh my God, they're going to shut this down. They're going to cut our pay. They're going to cut our benefits. They're going to, whatever it might be. And I would much rather like hand me the keys and let me talk to them specific again, because we don't have key man risk. If someone leaves big deal, I'll just helicopter somebody in from somewhere and we'll just take care of it. Key customers if they leave, like I want it. And now it's Josh prior, but I want us to be able to control the narrative and I want them to stand in front of us and understand, Hey, here's, these guys are better at this. They're investing, they're growing, they're here for the long term, whatever it might be. And no seller is ever going to be able to mimic uh, what Josh and I's passion would be and what we want and the way we want to say things. And are customers ever like, I'm out of here. Pretty much everybody's reasonable once they hear the story. 
Yeah, we've never had anybody leave. Yeah, it's not like they have a ton of other foundries they right. go buy. But I mean, part of it, honestly, it's it's normally the other way. You're we not normally McDonald's. get we normally get price increases. So we yeah, yeah. we're new <laughs> and the cost is going yeah, up. Yeah, so I'm Reg. Actually, yeah. yeah. Well, again, so and a lot of times that when there's key customers, like when there's customer risk, this has happened to me a couple of times, but one specifically. We had two customers that were 80% of the volume of the business. And I talked to him ahead of time and I was like, listen, I'm not, you need me to do this deal or else this place is going out of business. I can show you the financials. You can go bid me out. I know market pricing. I'm not going to take you guys all the way to our normal pricing, but here's what it is. This, the day we buy this, this will be your price. Just so you know, period. Um, they went out, they bid us out, came back and said, yep, no problem. Once but that get, was pre-close. That, that was, was during your due diligence. That's just because they were so big. And 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 does the seller ever in that time go, well, shit, maybe I should just raise the prices and keep this thing. I mean, there's a lot of them that do that post-close. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, there's, I mean, but part of it is, again, when you have two customers that are 80% and you haven't barely talked with the industry, you're scared to death. I mean, what they don't have a position of strength. If that those two customers walk away, what are we going to do? Okay, no big deal. We're out either you guys are going bankrupt or you're going to take our price increase. So there's no really downside there for us. Those two customers, I don't would never want to buy a company and lose. It was literally 50% and 30%. I would never want to lose one or both of those. There's not a lot of value left in there. There's still value for us because we needed the capacity and whatnot. But at the same time, that 80%, we wouldn't have noticed I mean, okay. in the grand scheme. So Difference in scale. So what you said is we go in at 9 a.m., they get a little shell-shocked, they take a three-hour break, we come in, we're eating some pepperoni pizza, we're starting to soften down, then there's like four days of getting to know everybody, yep. and then you said, uh, it's usually, we're not changing much, it's just redoing the incentives, increasing capacity, um, and then you're raising prices. Is there anything besides that that comes to mind that's just like all of these foundries need X? And maybe it's what you're doing on the back end through yeah. at corporate that you're able to provide them. <clears throat> yeah. Do you guys reshuffle the equipment, make the assembly lines look better? I always picture Marcus Limonis going in these businesses <laughs> and the warehouses look like hell. Yeah. And he always makes them look all you know yep. sweet and tidy. So moving equipment sometimes will happen long term almost never short term because once you start to reconfigure you have a multi-million dollar project and some of that shit can break too a lot of it old can break whatever so normally we won't unless it's simple maybe there's simple layouts and you know spaghetti diagrams some simple lean concepts maybe that stuff but not a lot beyond that the biggest thing for i mean that's the perspective of the employees into us what we have learned though the sellers into us is completely different. That's the big thing. We, we initially said, hey, we're not going to change anything up front. <clears throat> then we didn't really know how to handle sellers. Now we're very clear about it where first four weeks, we tell them the day we close, you stop doing, you and any of your family members that are leaving, your job is done as of today. All you have is you have four weeks where you teach us and we'll assign somebody. So we had a, had a close. We tell them like, write down all the stuff that you think you do. They'll inevitably forget stuff, but that is neither here nor there. Josh, now we'll go down, or Eric, whoever, we'll go down and write a name next to each task that each family member has. And then for the first four weeks, their job is only to teach whoever that name is what they do. So they no longer plan, they no longer buy, they no longer talk to customers per se. Like they don't do any of that. They just hand that over. After four weeks, then we kick them out of the facility for week five. Say, hey, Mr. Seller, you are not going to be here. Your family members are not going to be here. And we see how those names on that list cover it. They come back for week six. We go through the same process. Like, okay, what did we miss? What do we have to train on? Whatever it might be. They get booted out in week seven again. And then in week eight, we do the last one. We say, okay, based on this, we've had two kind of sink or swim sessions. What's the last things we need? What's your post eight week? What else do we need? How do we get a hold of you if we need whatever? But then, yeah, after eight weeks, our sellers are gone. Like we don't want them in the facility at all. They just, things just change so fast. The velocity at which we operate, which I kind of think of, and you know, it's an engineering geek term, but both speed and direction totally freaks out sellers. It, it can be pricing, it can be processes, it can be operate, but that's why we make them stop that day. Like we don't teach them the new ERPs. We don't yeah. teach them our systems and processes. We don't teach them the new payroll, none of that stuff. It's, you just teach us what you know, 
And the faster you're out the door, the happier everybody's probably going to be. Yeah, I was going to say, is there even much going on by week eight or you just have no. that in the system? Um, if, if there's the like, last... if week eight's a, a, a lot going on, something's not <laughs> yeah. happening. So right? the last, the last three times we've done it, they haven't made it past week six. Yeah. They didn't even come back for week seven. Yeah. So, uh, you're, uh, we're good. We're fine. We'll just let us, let us know where we can get a hold of you. Like, we'll give you that extra week. We can, we, we create that eight week structure in our purchase agreements just so everybody's on board about what it is and then we'll just be like hey you're we'll give you you can go next week and disappear all right i think that's a good way to bring it home if uh if somebody wanted to get in touch with you so that you can help more foundry owners disappear into the abyss and go live (laughs) their life how can people get in touch with you um at reg zeller on twitter or x or whatever we call it now is the easy way I'll, i'll maybe eventually find the dm Tag me online and someone will find me in the mass thing. I literally, I, I, I passionately believe and I will be willing to help anybody. The only thing I will say, I used to say I'll help anybody with anything. Now do the research ahead of time because the number of times I've answered the same question where I can just be like, I could Google that or I could search on Twitter and find this. Like, don't bother me with that stuff. Yeah. yeah. But send me something in advance or a specific question or whatever. I'm happy to do that. You're the man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, dude. The large companies have been doing this forever, Mm -hmm. and now it's finally making its way into small business, which is hiring a global workforce. But I think a lot of small businesses wake up and they think, you know, that's only something the large companies could do. It's got to be really complicated. I don't even know where to start. I think that's one of the coolest things about Relay Human Cloud is how simple it is. Jason, how simple is it to actually work with Relay Human? We had the same questions when we started. How how would you even do this? And most people stop right there. It's too complicated. How would we do it? We don't know. Uh, so what Relay Human Cloud has done is they've made that super simple. You you have the ability to log into a system that seems very familiar. It's not like logging into some website in India that you're worried about, right? They've made it very simple where you can log in. You can see all the candidates, see what fits what you're working for. You have somebody that you're going to talk to that's going to uh, help guide you. We 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 had uh, a gentleman that we were able to say, this is what we need. This is what we're looking for. And then once we got set up onboarding people, the talent is already identified. Once we've identified what we need, onboarding them becomes a matter of days. Very, very simple because these are talented people already in an office ready to go. And so uh, them being uh, added to your team can happen almost instantly. And from our experience, we've been able to when we identify a new need or that we need to add on to our team, we find that the the person once onboarded onto our team, within days they are up and running and taking over responsibilities or adding to the existing team that exists. And that is because of the, the process that has been put in place, uh, not only at Relay Human Cloud, but the process that once you're in the system doing it, it's very repetitive. And so we can bring people on just like it, it's actually easier than bringing someone on locally Yep. because they do a lot of the heavy lifting. We don't have to do it. It's yep. all done there. And so all we get to do is just start working. And so um, we have found it to be a tremendous value. And we're actually we're always looking for how can we continue to extend our workforce there because of the efficiencies it brings and the fact that we're not responsible for a lot of the the heavy lifting on the operational management, onboarding, training, all that stuff happens uh, at Relay Human Cloud.